I didn't hide you guys. <laughs> Hi, welcome to uh, episode 89 of the Brigadiers, the League of Beer and Comics. Welcome to what happens when I'm left to run things on my own. <laughs> uh, I was going to do that. I was going to do uh, the cold opening, but yeah, um, I'm on solo duties. I um, please remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment, and keep the co chats going that way. Please welcome our amazing guests. Um, Matt Knowles and Steph Cannon are here. How you doing? Hello. Thanks so, for having uh, us on. No, thanks for thanks for coming on. So you guys are the bi coastal pair who are, and the creative minds behind In Symmetry Creations, home of comic titles, Ayers, uh, the heirs of that's an English word. Why can't I say that properly? Heirs <laughs> of, the heirs of Isildur, um, which is a steampunk time travel uh, series and Tales from Nocturnia, which is a medieval fantasy series. You're also um, metal musicians, um, writers of anthology stories, freelance, freelance writing, and much more. Um, I uh, Matt sent me some links to your music so that I could create some sort of advertisement for you guys coming on, and was completely blown away by actually how heavy you were, which is <laughs> which is very <laughs> the, the 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 joke of um, being uh, slightly intimidated was. Um, <laughs> You guys are you guys are also um, massive parts of the US Comic Con scene. Um, I know that Matt is a is a panel moderator, and you've you've interviewed guests from from shows like The Mandalorian and Breaking Bad and uh, Better Call Saul. And uh, I, has to, I have to mention it because my thirteen year old loves it, but My Hero Academia. Oh um, man! Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the, vo the voice actors from that show are completely insane. Like, we we'll go to the shows and there's normal people there for a lot. When I say normal, I mean like a normal amount of people asking regular questions for the Breaking Bad actors in Mandalorian. But I've done two now where I've had my Hero Academia uh, voice actors there. And the whole panel room is completely full. And they're asking wacky questions like, hey, if I call and, and get a pizza place on the line right now, will you order a pizza in your character voice and then do funny. it? I mean, yeah. it's crazy. They have <laughs> fun. They have fun. They're good. They're, they're good people. They're, they're just, they're, they're very out there. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's Seth, um, obviously Matt's a really busy and phenomenal guy. I could, I, I could actually, when I was reading through what you guys do, I was quite amazed. You know, you do um, rock radio shows and everything, Matt. But Steph, you're talented and uh, quite unbelievably just as busy by the sounds of things. You've, uh, You've got stuff. Uh, you were a finalist in the Ghost City Comics competition. You, yeah, uh, that was yeah, that was kind of how I got my start. That was the first comic that I ended up doing in 2017, and they had a category for a one-page comic, and I thought that would be really difficult, but I want to give it a try, and, and I ended up getting finalists for it. And the the art from that, because it's it's really easy to post online when it's just one page. I can show off my entire comic that way. And so I had it on Facebook um, as part of like my profile, and that was uh, what. That's actually how Matt and I met. Is he was drawn to the 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 art and the and the story itself. So were you, uh, yeah, so you're you're the artist and writer behind that one page, yeah. Uh, I am just the writer. I yeah. the artist for that one was Javi Lapara, and so yeah. But Matt and I are both writers. We've got a whole slew of of artists from all over the world. You know. Um, Brazil, the Philippines, Guatemala, um, you know, we, we've, we've pretty much had artists from almost every corner of the world that have worked with us at this point. That's absolutely incredible. Um, and I assume you guys have met them through this forum as well. Like what you guys said, you said you guys met online. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Steph and I, um, we both many moons ago were, we're both friends with a uh, a uh, comic publisher, and uh, we both were showing him support in a thread. And um, the comment that Stefan put in there, even though she put her comment in weeks after I did, was um, something that just stuck out to me. So I clicked on her link and saw her one page comic that she just talked about, and I commented on like, "Hey, I really like the art in there. It looks really good." And um, I was two issues into the Heirs of a Sealed or Steampunk arc at that time. And uh, I had sent that to her alongside of some of the music. And that was something that impressed her. And I would let her, I'll let her speak on that if she wants to. But that was how our first 
impression of each other was through the cre the uh, the content creation we were already doing. And then the next thing you know, we're sitting here on a show with you after doing all the stuff that we've done for the last few years. That's quite good. So how does it work then? Because you guys are you guys are in completely different corners of of the world, <laughs> different from each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, that creative process as as an outsider looking in is quite fascinating. Um, how how does that work? <laughs> It's well, the power of technology. If we did not have technology on our side, there's no way we'd ever be able to do. It's crazy. We've actually had, you know, FaceTime or Skype uh, sessions where it's been me in California, Matt in Florida, and our artist in, you know, uh, Central America. Usually, you know, it's just crazy when you think about how how much work has to go into converging all these people together. But um, yeah, yeah, we're on we're on FaceTime every day. Like Matt says, you know, it's like two people being in a cubicle together in their office, except, you know, we were we're doing it, you know, face to face kind of like this. And so um, we we work a lot with Google Docs, Google Sheets. That's pretty much how we share everything we have. If it's streamlined like that, then anybody else that's coming in that needs to look at our scripts, the artists or whoever else may be involved in the project they're going to be able to see the same thing that we see. And it's in an easy way where we can just send a link and say, here it is, instead of trying to do things through email and, and, you know, things can get lost in the chain. Yeah. And it's made it really easy too, because, you know, like she said, we don't have to be like, Oh, we got to go travel to the office to go do our work. You know, we just get up, throw on some clothes and, and pop in. Hey, you know, it's time to go, go do the job, so to speak, and, you know, get on video chat and figure out what we have to do business wise and kind of go from there. So it's, it's, it's made it very streamlined and efficient. Um, how do you deal with the, I, I will actually talk about the project. So I'm just interested in the creative project where you guys have been so, so far away from each other geographically. Um, I, um, I, I've taken part in comic projects with um, Colin, who not only is, um, it is a superb writer in his own right um, and a successful writer in his own right, but he's also my best mate and my podcast co-host. And we find each other tripping over each other quite a lot. Is, is that something that you guys experience? Um, or or is, it, is it quite a fluid partnership? I would say we've got a really good partnership. I would say the best partnership. I wouldn't want the partnership with anybody else. Um, the way that we interact and the way that we link our minds on things is... I would say we start from the very top. And what I mean by that is we make sure we have the ultimate goal in mind. It's not about did Matt write the story? Did Steph write the story? Is it 51, 49, 50, 50? We just want to make sure that we have that project at the best level it can possibly be. Yeah. And if that is what it is, then who cares who put the ingredients <clears throat> into the pot? All the ingredients in the pot are what's going to make that stew be the best stew it can be. So I, I, I think too, I mean, we, we got along right from the get go and I'm, I'm, I'm traveling to Florida usually every six to eight weeks, mostly yeah, because yeah. that's pretty much our headquarters. Matt's office is there. He's got all of the, the programs, the Photoshop programs, but he also has uh, everything that we, we need for shows. And especially during uh, 2020 with COVID, Florida was one of the few States that was actually still having in-person events. They were not that many, Whereas in California, it was much, we were much more locked down, way more locked yeah. down. There was not anything and there still really isn't. We're still kind of resurfacing a little bit from that. Um, so we're, we're together in person as often as we can. But when you work with somebody that often, you just have, you know, there's just some people that I'm sure it's the same, uh, kind of like what you were saying, you know, where you just, you just automatically click with somebody. And so I think our personalities mesh well together too. I think if we both had the same type of exact personality, we would probably butt heads a lot more. That's awesome. Uh, that's really, that is really, really smart. So um, do you want to talk us through your, uh, your, your newest project when you, you're on Kickstarter just now, aren't you? So. Yep. Yeah. I got three, three days left. Let's stuff get into uh, what is actually there and I'll kind of bounce off her. But yeah, three days yeah. left. We got the link up there in the chat. Um, and the first thing I'll say is if you're somebody that's on the other side of the pond, we know that shipping absolutely sucks to try and ship something from the United States to anywhere over there. Um, so we do have a lot of digital tiers, a lot of things like that up um, so that that way, um, if you're somebody that doesn't want to be paying 
you know, a ridiculous amount shipping wise. You can get digital digital albums, you can get digital comics, um, but I'll let Steph talk about what is actually up there. So as you can see, the title is Heirs of Isildur versus Tales from Nocturnia, vinyl record and comic. Uh, those are our two IPs, our two main titles that we are working on currently. And Matt's a metal musician. He does the majority of the music with some with some guest musicians that we can we can talk about and kind of plug later. Um, with okay. the original <laughs> story arc for Heirs of Isildur, um, there was an accompanying uh, album, metal album that went along with it. And, and, and essentially the songs were background and information about the characters. So you would be reading the comic and it would say, to learn more about this character, go, uh, you know, listen to the song or you can see it on YouTube. And that was kind of what drew me to uh, Heirs of Isildur in the beginning because there were two issues out when he and I met. Uh, Cause I had never seen anything like that before. Not to that extent where somebody was creating a story and creating music to go along with it. So we always knew there was going to be another album. There was going to be more music. And there was also going to be another story arc for heirs. Uh, the Crossroads Conundrum was the first story arc. And it was 11, issue, 11 issues that we made into a, a trade paperback. That's 268 pages. It's got a ton of extras on it. Uh, you know, and some insight into characters and, and those types of things. So uh, the album, as time has gone on, slowly there were some songs that were kind of set in the Airs universe, and there were some that were set in the Tales from Nocturna universe. And so it, it ended up the way that it is now. There are five songs related to Airs and five songs related to Nocturnia. And so that, hence the verses, we thought it would be kind of fun to, to do a cover that would pay homage to the Marvel versus Capcom style, you know, kind of show the characters getting ready to duke it out. Uh, but really it's just that there's just half the album is about one IP and half is about the other. And then there is a, um, we, we call it a bridge issue or a one shot. There is a comic that is, is with this too, because at the end of the Crossroads Conundrum story arc, our main character, Michael Isildur, his fate was left unknown. And fans have been asking, readers have been asking, what's going on with him? We don't know. Is he dead? Is he alive? We're not quite sure what happened to him. It was very ambiguous the way that it ended purposefully on, on our part so that we could continue the next story arc, which is going to be called The Perilous Prospects. But we wanted to do something that would kind of be a quick one shot story that lets readers know what exactly happened to him uh, in between these two story arcs. And so that's what yeah. it is. I love the whole um, the, the whole music collab collaborating with comic thing. I think that's really, really, that's quite powerful. Um, we had um, Jason Everett on a couple of months ago for him to talk about his series Kid Chaos. And he had this really awesome thing happening in this comic where like he had um, suggested a suggested playlist to go with the comic as you're reading it. So yes. like, at, at the top of each page, you had a, a song. Um, and I was I was quite jealous. And I wish I'd thought of it. And I think it's really good. And I, I like um I like that you guys have um that, that this actually putting together music to um to subsidize the comic or to work to work alongside the comic is is quite incredible. Um, how, do you, how did you come up with that idea and, and, and how, how, how much does the music add to the theme of the comic? Do you think? That's, that's a great question. So I, my history is as a metal musician, I was in a, uh, a metal band toiling in the underground for uh, quite some time. And um, after a while, end of the end to 2000, 2008, 2009, I got really burnt out on, you know, trying to elevate from that underground level up to a level that was going to be able to, to sustain itself. And I just got tired of it. I've been a musician since I was in high school and I stopped playing, stopped everything. And, um, but I still had that, that itch to write every once in a while. And I knew when I decided to get back in, which was into 2015, beginning of 2016, that um, I wanted to write, but I wanted there to be something more. I wanted there to be a story yeah. that went along with the music. So you had multimedia going on with it. And um, I was finding myself going and pulling um, old pieces that had been written and just kind of, you know, lost to, you know, to dust and decay and, and, and repurposing them. And that felt very steampunk in its, in, in its, uh, yeah. in its literal sense. So we're like, well, why don't we take that and make that the, the look of what we're doing. And so that was what took the, the backstory and made the backstory kind of become a steampunk, um, a steampunk piece. And 
as time went on, a couple of musical songs turned into a short story, turned into a full album, turned into an ebook. Then it was taking that ebook and being like, you know what? I really don't want it to just be text. I want it to be an illustrated novel. And yeah. then I was like, you know what? Forget this. I don't want it to be an illustrated novel. I want it to look more like a comic. Um, one of the best things about the partnership between Steph and I was she came in from the ground from from day one where I'm going to be a comic writer. I want to write comics. I want to create comics. I've lived comics. I love comics. I came in as the metal musician trying to create that. And she's like, look, if this is going to be called a comic, we need to go and we need to do some some stuff to it and really make it work like as silly as it sounds there wouldn't even be word bubbles in what we do if it wasn't for what Steph did. Cause I really came from the illustrated novels part of the sort of things. Yeah. She was like, look, if you want it to be a comic, there has to be dialogue attached to the pictures. Um, and so when we got to the heirs trade paperback that she mentioned, we took two and a half months to reletter, reformat everything. So that way it's a full 11 issue book. That is, that is all comic. When we got to tales from Nocturnia, that one is fully co-written by Steph and I, and it's a full comic all the way through, totally different um, thought process to what's there. And when we were doing our Kickstarters for that series, every campaign video would have a little bit of music written for it. So if you go back and look at the Nocturnia 1, 2, and 3 campaigns, you'd hear a little tidbit of music. Every one of those things turned into a full song that's going to be on this album. So that's how we're like, well, what are we going to do with five songs over here for airs and five songs over here for Nocturnia? Let's create a mashup album. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, how much of it, how much of that sort of love of steampunk and, and metal music is shared? So is, is, is that your scene as well, Steph? <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny. I, I always say I, I wasn't, I didn't listen to a lot of metal music growing up or, or up until I met Matt, but not because I didn't care for it. It was just, something that I didn't have a lot of exposure to. I listened to a lot of rock, alternative. Um, it was kind of a genre of music that I just didn't, I, I had never I had never really listened to, didn't know a lot about. And I, I think I kind of uh, stereotyped it a little bit, but there's so many subgenres, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And now that I have been exposed to it, I, I, I really do love it. I, I love the energy and the passion that, that musicians put into it. We've, Matt and I have gone to a couple of live shows and it's, an experience that I haven't had. I've been to a lot of concerts, but metal concerts are very different in a great way, I feel like, because you just, it's infectious at the energy and everybody's happy. And I don't know, I, I think we could all use a little more of that. So uh, I am definitely a, a, a metal fan now and love, love the music that, that he's doing that I get to be a part of in, in whatever way possible and uh steampunk i was a big fan of wild wild west when it came out the movie and <laughs> and that was like I, I loved, <laughs> exactly i love like wild west stuff i love all of that and there's touches of that with steampunk and mm. uh, the aesthetic the clothing you know that, that you can't help but love anybody that's dressed fancy like that and but, um, yeah and the fun thing about steampunk too is is like you can't be really into steampunk without there being a smile on your face because it's whimsical it's serious, but it's, it's also silly. It's fun. I mean, you yeah. can't look at somebody being like, oh, I've got this big gauntlet on my hand. Like we've got a buddy <laughs> of ours that, you know, he's got like one of those um, clock fans that spins the uh, the time on it. And he's got yeah. it built into like his gauntlet on his arm. And I'm like, you, you, there's always fun to what it is. And so that when you can take fun and comics and metal and put it all together, I mean, that that is like the best of all worlds. I unfortunately have to dip out because... In California, it's it's we've got these odd odd times that our kids are in school, so I'm going to take my child to school. But oh. I'm, Matt is going to uh, continue to hang out. So I thank you very much. Well, and, nice you. and hopefully have you on again when it's thank you. Yes, we thank, you. Love that. <laughs> thank you so much, buddy. <laughs> All right, it's just you and me, man. What you got? Uh, I was actually gonna. My, my next question was for Steph, so I'm gonna actually see if you can answer it. <laughs> That's right. You know what? You know what? I'll, I'll either answer it as myself, or I'll pretend I'm her, and I'll answer it as if I was her. So I, I can reframe the question, I suppose. I was gonna ask about this. Um, Steph mentioned there about how, and and you, um, obviously, she uh, saying that it sort of big start wasn't really sure of a uh, metal um and 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 discovered the subgenres and and through you was, was opened up you know was opened to this new experience into this new world um 
I was going to ask her about the idea of, so it, again, you, you mentioned about how it was more of like, it was a picture, it was a picture book. It was, um, there wasn't much dialogue, you know, it was the music and, and uh, the illustrations. And then it was, you know, Steph that came in and, and started to, I was going to ask her about that kind of part of the process. I, I'm interested in how, obviously, music's really emotive as is visual art. And I wondered how, I, 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 I was interested in that sort of, um, the process of adding words to a story that already exists. Well, so so let me let me give you a little bit of, of insight there. So it was when we said an illustrated novel. So what that means is there was a lot of text. Like imagine yeah. a, a page in a book that just has like a picture um, on that page. So yeah. it wasn't so much that it was just pictures and then we added words. It was finding ways to take the the words that were there and the pictures that were there and more intricately tying them together instead of just yeah, having yeah. instead of just having something saying you know you know hey these two guys were on the podcast and they were talking and they talked about these things and then there's a picture of you and me on the podcast it would yeah. just be a picture of you and I and the conversation we're having like that was something i had to learn from her the yeah. show don't tell and it was it yeah. was more so it was more so taking a lot of the text that I had and reducing the text because if you're writing a book, you have to tell things visually or tell things in words so people can visualize it. With comics, yeah, yeah. it's visualized and you don't need to do all that description because it's already been visualized. And so she helped me to understand how to translate that from the, the written word into the visual um, interpretation of it. And how did you find that then? Was that was that quite an easy process, or did you no, find that? No, yeah. it was not. It was it was not an easy process at all because when you're used to writing, lyric writing is very much like writing poetry, um, and you're very you're very exaggerated in the things that you say in lyrics. Prose writing is something that is its whole different animal, and comic writing is a whole different discipline itself. So yeah. it it helped to have someone along that could. And I don't want to say teach me, but influence to to do it the the right way for the medium. And um, Steph did mention the perilous prospects earlier, which is the next story arc. That's been yeah. a really fun intellectual um, exercise for the two of us because I've had notes for where I wanted to go with the perilous prospects for years. Um, yeah. I've I opened up the folder. Hey, here's all my notes. And Steph and I have basically been like chess masters, and we've been moving the pieces around. How do we want to put this piece of the story arc in? Because one of the things we've realized is that if you're going to write something as a prose book, you would format it one way. You would probably tell the pieces of the story one way. If it was a webtoon that's coming out weekly, you would format it another way. If it's a TV show that is going to be coming out weekly, you would format it another. If it's a comic yeah. that you're going to get at your local comic book store that you know is going to come out every two weeks or every month, you might format that differently. But for us being people that write on Kickstarter, where you might not get a title for four months after the Kickstarter is done. And like, you might not get like issue one to issue two with a four month gap. It's really been one of those exercises saying every way to, to, to construct this story is the right way to construct it. But since yeah. we are constructing it for Kickstarter, we have to really go in and make sure that the pieces are moved around the right way so that if, say, you get the issue and you read it, you're going to get to the end and be like, okay, I can't wait to read that next issue, but I feel like I've gotten enough meat here to where I'm going to be hanging on and wanting to know what happens. Not going to be like, this is all over the place. I don't even know where we're going. Am I going to have to wait a year to even understand what the heck is even in this issue? Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Um... Uh, I think what I think makes that more interesting, I, 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 it's something that um, a lot of our guests and a lot of, you know, being at Comic Cons and chatting to guys, that that that, um, that gap is always something we talk about um, and the worry about having like, you know, having six months to, you know, sometimes a year between issues, you know. Um, a, and even like things like, and, and how that affects your writing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a subscriber to 2000 AD and it's okay. a really... Uh, it's a really interesting reading experience because um, sometimes if I'm not, you know, I try, I try to read it uh, issue by issue, 
uh, week by week. But sometimes you have that um, you have that period of time where you've maybe got four, you know, there's three or four weeks between, and, and I've got maybe three issues to read. And right. Even 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 the even the story style, but the way that the way that those stories are written doesn't doesn't um, lend itself to reading them back to back. You know, yeah. It's almost like it's almost like a soap in that you're there's like you you'll read an issue and then. They, 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 you'll read an issue of 2000 you you read six six pages and then um it's almost like the next six pages in that story have a gap there's like a natural gap in the progression of the story um there's also the whole thing about like um oh, I was gonna ask you about a uh, obviously you your yours is a multimedia um approach with like you know you've got you've got you've got uh, it's a it's a completely different experiential um piece of art i wonder like, do you do you do you find that as a way of keeping people committed and grasped in the fact that you know there is almost like a, a built-in revisibility a revisible nature to your comic yes is that is that yeah. designed or is that something that's well i think that's a that's a really good a really good thought there so one of the things that we do is even though we want to make sure that when you put the two pieces together, you get a totally different experience because you can go mm -hmm. through the first heirs book and it'll say, if you want to know more about this character, go listen to this song. So you can, yeah. you can have that pull out, but we also know that some metal fans don't give a crap about comics. And we know <laughs> that some, we know that some comic fans surely don't give a crap about metal music. And we didn't want to feel like we didn't want somebody who's a fan of one or the other exclusively to feel like they're being shortchanged by not being able to have that other piece. Yeah. So, so we've tried to make sure that what we write, like for Tales from Nocturnia, Tales from Nocturnia um, is a is a full arc that we did, a medieval fantasy arc. Think World of Warcraft, Dungeons and Dragons, and whatnot. You get to the end of the book, and we left open some stuff for potential um, for potential sequels, but the arc that you get in that book is totally there. When you get to the five songs that are on the album for Tales from Nocturnia, it'll say, hey, if you go back to issue one, when this thing was happening, this song yeah. is about that, and here's the character who is actually singing the song. This is from this character's point of view, and so if you were to go back and read the issue, you'd be like, oh, now I see that this is what that character was thinking this whole time because I've seen their thoughts in the song. So yes, it does give that little bit of different angle to what's going on. That's, that's, that is really, that's quite awesome. We had um, Stephen Tanner of Time Bomb Comics on um, yes. last year and um, a phenomenal guy and uh, hopefully coming back on in a couple of weeks. But he, he talked a lot about um, the Kickstarter experience and how at, at as as a, a forum of, of investment and as a way to as a way to have your comics um comics visited there's a there's a huge there's a there should be a huge emphasis that's probably lacking in some kickstarter campaigns about how you know if if, if you are a backer of a kickstarter rather than a a consumer going into a shop to buy the comic you're you're um you, you you've engaged with the comic differently and your investment should reflect that so you know you're engaging with a you're engaging with um the fact that you're caught you know the comic you, you know you're, you're putting your faith in something that may or may not come out and then you're possibly you're also engaging with the fact that um a you know you if you walked into a shop you wouldn't have to pay postage so there should be there should be something as an investor or a, a, as, a, as a pledger and a kickstarter i should say that um, you should get, you know, there should be there should be a, a punch to your buck. You should be getting yeah. you should be getting more because you because you of of why you did it. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's something yeah. really cool about yours. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that thought process. I mean, we one of the things, and we're actually going to be doing a podcast later on tonight with uh, some of our friends in the industry. Um, so it's yeah. probably going to be middle of the night for you. Um, that talks <laughs> about um, that talks about what excites you about what you're doing, because one of the things that sometimes unfortunately gets lost is that um, if Steph and I got on this podcast and we're just like, yeah, go back our campaign, give us money, give us money, yeah. give us money. You're not going to be, you have no desire to just go throw your money at something that you're not going to get an investment back on. We want, we want the people that are, that are considering becoming a part of our campaign to feel like that they are going to be investing in one creators that they like and two 
either characters that they can um, relate to or, or universes they want to escape into. Uh, we want them to feel like they are going to get a, a, an ability to escape and then get into a really good story, invest themselves in that. But also when it comes to the Kickstarter side of things, that we are going to find ways to give back to them. Um, yeah. you know, while obviously we want our backer numbers to go up and our dollar numbers to go up, we want to make sure that guy who backed number one or number four, or number 12 knows, hey, just because I backed early, do they still care that I'm a part of this campaign? Yes. Um, just before we got on, we just crossed over 10,000 American. And that's, that's a that, that's a huge milestone for us. And uh, like literally had to go up there, put up the graphics for ten thousand. Um, so already our physical backers have already got four different uh, Hall of Foil trading cards that are going to be added into their pack. So if you just got the first issue, you have four Hall of Foil trading cards that are going to be added in. We just unlocked a um, a uh, three inch sticker set. So everybody's going to get one of those added. And if they want to make sure they get all of them, they can add that tier on or that that add on on. But we want to make sure they know that there are things they're going to be able to get. Um, yeah. <laughs> I see our, I see you're up on our garbage pail kids there. Yeah, we uh, I'm a big garbage pail kids fan. And um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, we uh, we have a friend of ours, Richard Rivera, who's really big in the the homage cover game and has done a got a, a really good business for he writes Stabity Bunny, uh, Shadow Play for Scout Comics. Uh, he's also the, the head of the, the sub label Scoot for Scout Comics, the kids label. And um, yeah. we did a lot of shows with Richard and, you know, that was just something that we kind of learned from him. Hey, you know, people like some familiarity and I'm a huge Garbage Pail Kids fan. So it was natural. We're like, let's go take some of our characters and make them into Garbage Pail Kids. And that's how we have those. So, I, yeah, I, 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 as somebody that spends a lot of time on Kickstarter and spends a lot of time particularly loving, I, 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 find myself a lot of the time backing um backing projects because on the strength of the um the strength of some of the the stretch goals and um the so it's, i don't know I, i'm a wrestling fan so I, I often use the word gimmick to describe stuff but uh, hey i'm, I'm, I, I'm a I'm wrestling fan as well <laughs> <laughs> wrestling fan as well man i get it i get it you love the stickers you love the merch like it's good the comic's amazing and i think what's incredible about um about your campaign is and, and, and just the presentation, the, the idea that you can have, you know, so I love the fact that Insymmetry Creations isn't just a comic company. It's 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 so much more. It's um, I, I, I I'm a obviously massive a uh, rock music fan. So the the idea of um, tying and we we talk we talk about this a lot on the podcast, tying your music to your to your comics. Like I always have like my music blaring when I'm writing, and um. I've got um, certain songs associated with certain parts of my comic just because I, I remember what I was doing when I was writing that scene, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's um, I think you guys have, you've tapped into something really, really special. I, I know that there's sort of quite successful bands like Jimmy Eat World and uh, Coheed and Cambria that have done it in the past where they, they have like produced comics and the graphic novels to support music and music to tie into music to tie in with something else they're writing it's just it's such an incredible thing and uh, i think you guys need to give yourselves a total pat on the back for that it's a really awesome aspect of what you're doing yeah good well, good yeah, that definitely, in there. Yeah, yeah. definitely appreciate that yeah one of the things one of our one of our mantras is that we want to make sure that when somebody's done reading the book and they put it on their shelf that the ip yeah. the, the story it doesn't just doesn't stay on the shelf with them. We want to make sure there's music or there's other merch, there's shirts. Uh, we have woodworkers that have worked with us. We have, uh, as you saw in the campaign, there's a leather worker, a company called GB Leatherworks uh, that are some of our good friends, uh, Harrison Hansen and Martin Irish that have done some wild things for us. Those are actually um, leather turntable mats because this campaign has got splatter okay. vinyl records. So those are actually all handmade and Imagine what you'd think of as a leather worker, the guy in his little shop with his little hammers and doing all the hand stitching and all that. That's what these dudes do. I mean, it is like a harken back to the mid, the mid, the, the medieval times. And so that's how they do their stuff. So he's, they've made these leather turntable mats for us. And they're, they have for the Kickstarter campaign, they have some glow in the dark elements on there, which you, who's going to have glow in the dark leather. I mean, that's, that is just something we wanted to make it really special, really cool. And, um, <laughs> yeah so that's so that's go. that's the uh the leather <laughs> thing, you know, that's in action um, that's so cool man that's so for, cool for our last campaign as you see there's dragons there for our last campaign um 
there was a lot of dragons involved because it was for Tales from Nocturne, the medieval campaign. And they're like, we want to do some really cool things. We know we've done gauntlets and we've done this. And they made us these little baby dragon head keychains, but they made these gigantic, massive dragon lord um, masks, like, like cosplay masks. And we're like, who's going to want to buy one of these things? But we sold a bunch of them through the campaign. And um, people just loved the fact that that we had these big, massive things that became very meta. Like we made sure it was in the issues. We actually put a little hidden spot in the issue where we actually drew Harrison in at a little medieval booth selling these Dragon Lord masks in the comic that we actually are selling at our table at the shows. That's so smart. Have him. Um... Well, just talk about the shows then. How um, how have you guys managed? So I know you're you're in Florida, aren't you? So I know that yes. the restrictions weren't as a uh, restrictions weren't as um as as extensive there. But um, I, I still imagine that that huge part of your life, your, your your life that your, your livelihood was taken away from you, just like all of us. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was rough. It was it was interesting because uh, before we got on, we talked about how being in different states, like you know, you're you're in Scotland, that's a part of the UK, and there's some different pieces of Scotland that are very Scotland centric, but you still are a part of the the greater UK. In the US, yeah. I'm in Florida. Steph's in California. We're all Americans, but the pandemic really made it feel like that Steph was in a whole other country from where I was yeah. in Florida because. Florida tried as hard as they could. Let's reopen. Let's reopen. Let's reopen. Um, I was involved in, and we were involved in the very first Comic-Con in the United States to actually come back online, which was Collective Con Jacksonville. And yeah. they set the blueprint for how shows could come back. Every single person yeah. had to be wearing their mask, social distancing, um, hand sanitation stations, um, you were getting temperature checked in your car before you even got to the, uh, to the venue. Um, oh, I was wow. the panel host. I saw I'm the moderator up there on stage with actors and we're up on stage. There's pictures of us with our masks on doing interviews through the masks, because even though we were distanced from everybody, we had to make sure we were showing the example to people in the audience. Yeah. It doesn't matter that we're on the stage. We're still doing the right thing. Um, there were some amazing um, comic book stores, some local comic book shops across central Florida that were able to open their doors, Kingdom of Comics in Melbourne, the collective in um, in Altamont Springs, uh, Breed of Browncoat, where I'm at in Ocala, or just uh, just to name a few, um, that really did a good job of, of doing what they could to support these creators that were not able to go to the larger shows. So, you know, Steph would fly here. We would do some shows here. I still think we ended up doing maybe 10, 10 events post campaign like post covid wow. yeah. so we probably had comic book stores i think we had three three or four actual um shows but florida had the blueprint california steph had been on panels at san diego comic-con the past two years she was on panels at WonderCon, anaheim and those things don't even have a hope of coming back yet they they claim they're going to come back but they don't even have a hope yeah. of coming back so all the shows that we would have done out there, um, there wasn't even a chance. We actually had events in five different states that got uh, canceled last year. And so that kind yeah. of sucked as we had five different yeah. states we were going to be in. They all got canceled. But it then becomes, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to sit around and cry? Or are you going to figure out how to evolve your business and evolve Absolutely. what you're doing right and right and right and get some Kickstarter campaigns out there and find ways to grow your business, network with other creators. Um, one one group I will actually shout out is uh, Fanbase Press out of California. As soon yeah. as everyone yeah. got locked down, um, they started doing a weekly call. Anybody that wanted to get on the call was, was allowed to just get on. It didn't matter if you were a new creator that had not even put out a comic issue or you were somebody, they're literally the first call I was on there was someone who was a judge for the Eisner Awards. Um, David, wow. Aval <laughs> yeah, David Avalone, who does the Elvira comics, uh, is yeah. one of the people on there. So everybody was treated as a as an equal on those calls. And for the first for the first three to four months of the of the lockdown, religiously every Saturday afternoon, here we all are getting on here, sharing our stories, helping each other out, and developing yeah. friendships. I, I would call David Avalone a friend of mine now, and there's no way in the world I would have met him 
before the fan base press calls. I consider the people at fan base press and a lot of the other people that are on those calls as actual friends now. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, we probably never would have met. So that was a good way that we were able to, um, to evolve what we did yeah. to, to meet the pandemic that we all were going through. That, that has been echoed so many times. That's probably I think the pandemic and lockdown and, and, and all, all the other buzzwords. We, it was, was crap for so many people. And it continues to, uh, me and my wife talk about this quite a lot, William, about the um, sort of the long-term effects on, on folks' mental health and anxiety. And, and now that the, uh, in Scotland things are starting to open back up, we're, uh, we're having, you know, there, there, there's there's even situ there's even anxieties that come with that. But um, what the one thing I'll take away from it, uh, particularly through the podcast, the one thing I'll take away from um, the pandemic is being able to widen the net network that I had. You know, um, I was very local, um, hanging around in local breweries, chatting to guys from Central Scotland um, for this podcast. And now, like, obviously, we've got yourselves, and we have a. Uh, we had uh, Alex uh, Alex Luca from California on a couple of months ago, and and, and yeah, and, and again, fought with genuine genuine dudes and dudettes that I would consider friends that I probably wouldn't have considered even reaching out to like a year ago. It's it's I'm um, quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, and like you're saying about the mental health aspect of it, I I we've we've been able to really see that as well because Steph and I both have uh, both have teenage daughters that are both the same age, both in the same grade in school. And in Florida, they were able to go back to school at the start of the year. In California, they were still, I would say, I, I always say it was basically on house arrest all the way up until just probably yeah. about a month ago. So my daughter was able to get the experience of, of what it takes to be a freshman in high school in the USA her entire year. She was able to play her, her, her freshman sports seasons. Um, yeah. while, while Steph's daughter was unable to do that. And we got to see the differences in strain that it would, it would cause just in our own two households, because yeah. I could only imagine if the roles were reversed and my daughter was the one that was stuck in the house, she would have lost her mind. She's like, dad, yeah. you and I are cool, but I've already been here for, th I'm going back to school. I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so I can only imagine being, a, being, being Steph's kid, being stuck in the house for over a year yeah, was, was tough for him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just um, I'm glad that we've been able to kind of look at the, this and, and pull some sort of strength from it. But yeah, really, really awful times. So with with things opening up, what is a what's the plans going forward? Have you got have you guys oh, got that, anything? Yeah, we actually, um, you know, you probably probably this is probably the first time that we've actually been able to talk about this. But um, you know, we do have some some smaller shows coming up. But um, one of the shows that we were supposed to be at last year, which got canceled, obviously, for the pandemic, was a Galaxy Con that's in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is um, up the East Coast of the United States. Uh, we've never been there. We've had a, a lot of friends of ours that have been there and sing the praises of that show. And yeah. literally just yesterday, we were able to confirm that we are actually going to have a table at, at Galaxy Con Raleigh. So oh, that's going to that's gonna be happening in um, in just about two and a half months. So that's one of the plans we have over the summer. There's a lot of shows that compressed into the end of August into um, October, beginning of November. We're still trying to figure out the logistics of those shows because we're like, I don't know how Steph is going to be able to handle being in California and coming over here to do a weekend show and a three day show and a weekend show and a weekend <laughs> show five weekends out of six. So we're having to figure yeah. out how we're going to, to make that happen. But it's just keeping the ball rolling. You know, like we say with our campaign, yeah that the train is about to leave the station in three days uh, when it comes to the Kickstarter campaign, but there's still room for everybody. You know, once you get on, yeah. it's all aboard. We're going to keep that train rolling. We're going to um, get the comic done, going to get the album done. Uh, we're going to jump straight into the Perilous Prospects arc for Heirs of a Sealed Door. And like Steph said, we have some other projects that we're working on that we can't really talk about in specifics right now, but we do yeah. have a we do have a story that is completely G-rated, completely a kid story that has been oh, incredibly fun for us to work on that um, is hopefully going to be able to be announced and see the light of day soon. We have some anthology pieces. Uh, we just had a piece in um, in uh, Orange Cone Productions, Cthulhu Invades Oz, that came out. And uh, oh, they have another, yeah, they have another anthology coming out, which is Cthulhu Invades Wonderland, that there'll be a Kickstarter for later on in the year that uh, we're going to be a part of that as well. So... Um, you know, we're just trying to make sure we keep keep creating, keep learning, keep evolving, yeah. 
and uh, try to find the right shows. We don't feel like we have to be at every single event that's out there, but we want to be at the right in-person events to just to grow our brand. That's amazing. That's really, really smart. And probably on, well, sorry, I've got a five-year-old running around. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's past his bedtime. Uh, we normally, I, 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 know, I would have asked you before we went to air and I forgot to because. Sure, hey, it's all good. Yes, me. But um, we, uh, it's funny you were talking about like the mute, like whether you like music or whether you like comics, you know, you're able to come into it and, 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 and get something. Uh, and we're a, we're a beer and comics, we're a beer and comics podcast. So as well as uh, the, 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 the podcast, um, the, the, the podcast came to light um, through the idea that me and my friend Colin um, are both frequenters of a, of our local comic book shop and they opened a craft beer store two doors down so that became quite a big what was already quite a big part of our life became an even bigger part of our life and so we thought oh let's let's, let's podcast this and that's basically the birth of the podcast um but often we have comic guests on and um i do I always double check to see if they like beer before um <laughs> and, and, and vice versa if we have a, if we have a beer if we have a, a guest from the beer industry i'll always ask do you like comics beforehand because I have been caught out in one of my first interviews with them, uh, Emily Tasson, who is uh, who is a, um, a great advocate of um, equality within the beer industry in Scotland. I asked her what comics she liked, and she all live on air was just like, none. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. I should have asked beforehand, but uh, do, hey, do you enjoy hey, beer? It's okay. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. You see this, uh, you see this cup right here? This cup is full of water. I have, as crazy as it is, as crazy as I have fronted death metal bands, I have I do what I do. I, I look like I do. I have never had a sip of alcohol in my entire life. Which That's to incredible. someone to someone that is is you know from from your area, you're probably like, are you insane? <laughs> How is that possible? But um, but like I said, there there's a big culture to it in the United States. Um, I mentioned Kingdom of Comics. One of the mm. that's it's probably a comic shop. If you lived in the U.S., you would probably uh you would probably be there every day because it's a yeah. classy comic establishment that has got a super cool bar right there. So there's people that come oh, in. We've, nice. done some, we've done some signings there and nice. um, we've done some signings there and, um, and there's people just come in 10 o'clock. They're, you know, sitting down and hanging out with the staff, come over to our table for a little bit, go sit back down, talk to their buddies, come back over a little bit later. And you know, then they might buy something from us, but it's, they, they've established a community that's around that, which is really neat. That is really neat. Um, I think that, I think that community is a very. I personally think that community is a really really important part of, of the of the comics and and obviously part of of the metal scene, the music scene, the um, even the, like the drinking scene. Like uh, that community and that always we always come back to that on the podcast. We seem to always come back to the podcast, even with the um, even we have guests. Um, we we have comic book shop. We've had a couple of comic book shop guests on. The owners of comic books and that's the one thing they were always saying they were like how are you feeling about covid and they're just like miss my community i miss my group of friends i miss the fact that uh, i i work in this place um hey so guess what i think somebody might be backstage i can i can see her i don't know what you guys can see but uh let's see, let's oh, see I, can bring her I, I couldn't see her she texted me she said hey let him know i'm backstage there she is though okay <laughs> 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 That was. Did you just finish the school run? Did you? I did. Yeah. So you guys were back on. So I hope it's okay that I just pop back in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what? What? But the reverse twenty minutes and ask you. Uh, literally, just as you disappeared, I was going to ask uh, you a question. That. Um, okay. Um, but Matt, Matt covered it. It was really, really interesting. But um, now I need to remember what that question was. <laughs> you know what? I, if if I was him, I would say, "What was it like?" taking something that was not really in comic form and saying, wow, this is, he wants us to be in comic form and it's not. What was the process like to take this thing that either had too much words or too much graphics and turn it into something more comical? That's what the question was, right? Or something along those lines? It was along those lines. Thanks, Matt. Matt is the, the new co-host of The Brugginers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of his strengths. <laughs> it was a lot of, it, it was a lot of work, but it was, it felt at times like a lot of work, but it was also fun. And it's weird to say fun because yeah. there were times when it was just, we were really bogged down with the process, but it was, 
it was a very um it was it was almost cathartic it was it was it was interesting to take this this thing uh you know this piece of literature that we knew you know beginning middle and end how it was going to go and say how do we how do we make that into comic form is there what's the easiest way to do this and um you know i was a comic reader but matt knew enough about comics to know how it was going to go yeah um so what what was the solution to that then well how, how did what where, where did you um because you, you you mentioned there about um trying to find the easiest way to do it was there an easy way or did you did you did you have you just found something that works i feel like it was easy even though it was a lot of work it was a lot it was time intensive and it was a lot of work but it was easy in the way that we knew where we were going we knew what we needed to do matt knew that he was going to have to letter with proper word bubbles so that it would look like a comic and one of the things that we pride ourselves on is if there's something that we don't know we're going to learn how to do it we're going to ask questions we're going to consult experts we're going to consult people that that are in that field or have experience with that and we're going to do a lot of research so that we can learn and add it put a new tool in our toolbox so to speak so matt yeah. spent a lot of time learning how to letter it's not easy i think a lot of people think oh you just you know draw a circle and put the words in there but it's not and there are a lot of a lot of <laughs> lettering rules and you don't realize that there are lettering rules until you look at a comic that breaks them and it's very distracting you don't want it to be that way you want the the, the word bubbles to be almost invisible in the, in the way that unless they are trying to make a statement like a like a sound effect you want yeah. you want them to be seamless and just you know, not distract yeah. from the art or the story. So that's a process. Yeah. It takes a lot to learn. And to his credit, he he learned very quickly to do something that kind of went against his 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 natural instinct to want to write, you know, the way that he had before. And that's just that just is a testament to his adaptability. Yeah, I think for both of us too, we both we both have a stubborn streak in us. And there's a lot of times where we know the no, other person. Don't. <laughs> There's a lot of times where we probably know the other person is right, but we want the way we're doing it to be the right way. And after we, you know, kick our feet and do our little, you know, pouty face for a little bit, we realize the other person isn't saying it because they they want to just be right and they want us to be wrong. They're like, hey, this is the right way for us to do it so that when somebody else looks at our product, they're going to say it's a legit product. They're not saying it, it's it's who cares which person's way is right as long as we choose the right way overall for in sim yeah yeah that's some that's amazing um it's also hard though like um i, um, I really like that ethic about um, that work ethic behind uh, uh, like I, I you know if i don't know i'm going to find it out and i'm going to try and, and try and master it i think that's really powerful it's something that um it's something that i've tried to do in the last year where um a the first issue of my series I, I just wrote and sort of outsourced everything else whereas um I'm, I'm trying to cover most if not all of it in my last issue um and uh, when you start to like when you start to look at what you've asked other people to do when you're trying to learn it for yourself it's it, it is it is hard Let, lettering is solid like i didn't think i assumed that like i was like um and even just be things like um I, I've been told by a couple of people about just you know even the the way that you you form your your sentence so that you have like more word you have less words in the top line and the bottom line than yes. in the middle line. It's just like you look at it and you're like, of course, why didn't I know okay. that? Why have I, why have I been reading comics for my entire life and never noticed that that was the thing? Isn't um, that funny how that works? There's a lot of those little lettering rules that we we learned and and it's like oh yeah that makes sense. I guess it is how it is. But that again goes with the fact that. You're not meant to notice it. It's just supposed to kind of be there, just like words on a page. Absolutely. Um, we talked a wee bit while you're off air um, about the fact that uh, Florida and California had completely different um, restriction rules, and that, yeah. that 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 created a lot of that 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 could have um, and and did in some ways create quite a lot of issues. But you you were able to overcome it. How did you find California during lockdown? Oh gosh, it was it was tough, and and yeah, you know, Matt was explaining you know the difference in school for our our, our kids, and that that's been the toughest yeah. thing. It's, it's hard as a parent, I'm sure you know, when you when you see yeah. your kid, you know, struggling, and there's nothing that you can do about it. It's such a helpless feeling. It's really difficult. Um, but yeah, we 
are still kind of in the stages. And and one thing about Florida is they they do a lot of mid-sized comic conventions. So California, of course, has San Diego Comic Con. Everybody knows, you know, that's kind of the the granddaddy of them all, as they say. Uh, but we've got a lot of we 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 do have a lot of larger cons. The smaller ones in the middle size shows are a lot more difficult to find, or they're just not as heavily advertised or known about. Yeah. Florida has a huge comic writer scene right now um, and artist. There are many creators from Florida. In fact, Matt was just at an event. Uh, a few weeks ago at a comic shop called The Collective in Central Florida, mm-hmm. where they they hosted uh, a lot of creators that are involved in um, uh, the Cthulhu. Cthulhu Help me with the title. Thank Cthulhu you. Cthulhu yeah. Invades yeah. Odds yeah. title. Uh, yeah, that we well, there's a lot of Cthulhu <laughs> stories out there. So I'm like, I kind of yeah. blanked on which one it was, but. We uh, have have a little bit of a short story in that one and uh, like a little one page uh, fun story that we did in that. But anyway, the point is, is that there was a lot of creators that were at this event to sign books and they were almost all of them native to Florida and it was over 18 creators. So that just goes to show there's a, there's a very large community of them. And in turn, a lot of them know about these shows. A lot of them know about these, these comic conventions and there we were faced with having to attend ones that we, may have not either known about or had the opportunity to attend. And so it was, um, it was interesting. Yeah. But yeah, California is a, we're, we're supposed to be opening back up next month. We'll see how it goes. We have got this weird color coded tier system where it's like purple is like the most restrictive and now we're down to orange, you know, <laughs> so we can actually eat inside restaurants again, which is, I have, you well, know, that, that's Monday for us. I think, I think you, <laughs> We we have a numbered system, and I think you can eat in a restaurant, but not with alcohol, until Monday. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we so. were the same way. I think bars just barely opened. Um, that yeah. was one of the things that they were holding back on. But before that, it was you know you would if you want to eat, you have to either take it home or you can eat outside. Yeah. So it was yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> well, I was just into that. Like obviously, beer is quite a massive part of our podcast normally, and um, so pubs and like. The, back in the sort of early year you know we've been a podcast for two years and one of those years has been in lockdown but the first year was uh, predominantly at beer events and comic events out and about um and just yeah just the, the, the hoping for that scene to just rekindle so at the moment in scotland you can drink but you have to drink outside in outdoor spaces so yeah i don't know if that's the same in uh, california where you have these yeah. weird like you just have te- all pubs have tents now, which is yes. absolutely. <laughs> it's so weird. It's funny, and that our restaurants are the same way because once yeah. it in the summer it was okay, but uh, once we got into kind of like some cooler months, then we needed they needed to erect these tents, and so yeah, it was it was kind of interesting driving. I would drive down, you know, one of our our main rows that has the most restaurants, and it's just all these tents out everywhere, <laughs> you know. So um, I guess you know if you if you want to go out and eat and have that experience, then you know yeah, <laughs> it's better than totally. nothing. We got we kind of had to take what we could get. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad that we we're kind of moving there, and I really look forward to I don't know, um, you just things getting bigger, and you guys finding more success this year, um, even more success than you've already had because it's you know, it you it, it looks like it's going places, and it looks like it's going places quite quickly by the. You know, yes. so that's really that's exciting. Um, yes. I usually um, I'm going to try to tie tidy 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 things up just now. That's like they're messy. Tie things up just now. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, is there any? Is there anything else that you guys you got um, social media? I, I've got last year. Is there anywhere you would like f- to direct us to? Is there anything else you wanted to blather about before we we called it an evening or a morning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, one, the one thing I would say is. Like I said, we've got three days left in the campaign. Uh, we end on Sunday. So anybody wants to go up there and check it out, we really appreciate that. Um, we always are about making sure you feel like you've gotten value for your dollar. Uh, one thing that we didn't cover, which I'll make it really quick, um, is uh, as when you were scrolling through, uh, you saw there was one cover with a guy that looked like he was sitting on a Game of Thrones throne. Um, yeah. That is Corey Steger. He was a musician that has played on all the Heirs of a Sealer albums. Um, he was an original member of the band Under Oath. Uh, he recorded his tracks for this album on March 6th and then was tragically killed 11 days later on March 17th. 
Um, so we changed, we changed up our campaign just slightly so that we could, um, we could make sure that we were honoring that as Steph said early on, um, this, the comic is about basically our main character, Michael is sealed or is he alive? Is he perished or is he somewhere in between? There was a lot of graveyard imagery we were going to use for some of our uh, variant covers. We removed all those immediately because we didn't feel like that was yeah. going to be appropriate with the situation that happened with Corey, but, uh, we were able to get James Sims to come in and do this um, homage cover, this tribute cover for him that myself and Steph and Corey's best friend, Rick Lobb put together. Um, and that is obviously the Game of Thrones throne, but it is made of the guitars that Corey played over his 20 year plus career in, in metal. Um, all the guitars that are visible that you can see are ones that either he, that have special meaning that he either played on our albums that uh, that are owned by those of us in the um, that are in his inner circle, um, or ones he played when he was an under oath. Um, any one of those covers that is sold, uh, we're taking a portion of those proceeds and we are contributing them back to his uh, his uh, small children that were left behind. Um, you know, they're in a good situation. It's not like oh, they're not going to eat if they don't get it. It's more of a a um, show of support to these kids so uh, they can see later on down the line here. Here's these people that I don't even know that didn't even know my family but they helped support us um, and, and wanted to make sure that we were encouraged in our, in our time. So that's the one thing that I would want to just make sure we leave with is we do have that that's out there. Um, and like I said, we have three days left in the campaign and I'll, I'll turn it over to Steph since she came back in here and I'm sure she's got something she wants to talk about too. Uh, as far as the, the, the future goes in the near future, I should say we do have other projects that we are currently working on. Of course, we're going to get, because we, there is no rest for us. So we're going to uh, dive headfirst into The Perilous Prospects, which is the second story arc for Heirs of Isildur. And of course, we will be working on fulfilling the Kickstarter and sending that out as items come in. Um, and then we have another project that we are working on that we actually can't say much about, but what we can <laughs> say is it's going to be, not quite yet, but soon, hopefully. But it's, it's very fun. It's G-rated. It's very unlike anything that we've ever done before. And we've had a blast working on it. And we're excited about the opportunity and excited to be able to finally talk about it. Um, we have a, for anybody that might be listening that is local to Florida, uh, we do have a show coming up June 5th. Fifth and sixth. Six. Fifth, fifth and sixth. Okay. Uh, uh, called Lake Collecticon. And it is in Lakeland, Florida. Leesburg, Leesburg Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember, I'm not from Florida, sixth. so I only yeah. know so much. Yeah, that's of the one day show on the sixth, we have a signing the day before at a different location. Right. I'll let Matt since I just. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Well, you, you, might, you might have been getting your cup of coffee, but I actually did. Um, talk about the show that we just got confirmed yeah, that was canceled. That was canceled uh, last year on us. That we finally confirmed that we're going to be at Galaxy Con Raleigh this year. Yes, and we are Very super yeah. super stoked about that because it's supposed to be a great show. It's going to be fun to see what another state is doing to make these shows happen because we've only seen what Florida's done because they're basically the only one that's done it. That's good. yeah. Um, that it, it's optimism's the the word. That, that that's all super exciting and. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really glad that we've now got to this point where I can be asking guests, "What have you got coming up?" And like, you can get, I you guys can that. be excited about the future. That's been so long. So isn't that nice? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's nice to hear and it's nice to talk about. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm really, I, I would love to get you guys back on when you've um, when you've got your, uh, um, your 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 secret projects are being are being <laughs> are being uh, are being shouted. Yeah. We would um, absolutely love to come back on and chat. That's great. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I've put your, uh, is there any other social media or websites that I've, I've obviously got your um, your Twitter feed there at uh, Insim, uh, Creations, uh, Insymmetry Creations, at Insymmetry Creations on Instagram and then insymmetrycreations.com. Um, is it at Insim, isn't it, for uh, your Facebook? For Facebook, yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah awesome. just just that and our and our short link to the Kickstarter campaign. That's pretty much where you can get a hold of us. A magic, uh, which is on the screen, but I'll put it in the comments again. So for any of us in the comments for the audio as well, guys. Um, yeah, thank you so and you know what? Yeah, let's let's say hey to Neil Bailey. Neil Bailey jumped in. I'm doing fine, guys. Been busy lately. Glad glad to be back. Enjoying the show tonight. Didn't want his comment to slide by. He said he's well, enjoying the show. So, we don't so, forget so, Neil. Neil. Neil's a good guy. Neil's a good guy. Thank you. Thank um, you, Neil. Thank, thank you, Neil. You. Pleasure to hear from you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, guys. Uh, and um, I'll speak. We'll speak to you all again. Cheers. 
Sounds good. Thank Thanks you. for all that. Thanks so much.